President, thank you for the introduction, fellows and guests. St. Wiston's at Repton is one of the most important churches of the Anglo-Saxon period, for many reasons, but let's mention its royal connections, the amount of surviving Anglo-Saxon fabric and the historical puzzles it presents. Our understanding of this building has been transformed, uh, just a minute, what do I press in order to get the next slide? There we are, just to give us the setting. Our understanding of the building has been transformed by the investigations undertaken, especially since 1971, by Harold Taylor, Martin Biddle, and Birte Kjolby Biddle, as indicated by this slide, which gives you an indication of just how much work has gone on and into the building. And I would like to thank Martin most warmly for the help he has given me in reaching an understanding of their work in discussion, in providing off-prints, and in recommending publications. I really am most grateful. Similarly, my thanks go to the people I have met at the church for their help and kind hospitality, especially on Mondays. The paper has two sections. The first presents a brief history of the site, which is a summary of the evidence discovered and the conclusions reached by Harold, Martin, and Birta. And the second consists of my analysis of what in those conclusions I think can be debated. To begin by locating the place, just for the record as it were, the Anglo-Saxon history of the building can be divided into eight phases. Phase one, the first church. We know there was an abbey at Repton in the late seventh century because the life of St. Guthlac says he took his monastic vows there around that date. Little is known about this church. And if I go to the next slide, that church that you see there uh, on the screen on the left, that's just a place marker because it gives you an indication as to where you might think, that, what you might think the relationship is between the second phase, which is the baptistry mausoleum, and the original church. It's reasonable to assume it lay to the east of the church, especially as when the church was enlarged, which is, gives us the building that we have today, that's where it was, to the east of the building. So, in phase two, a square structure was built, and, as I've already said, it is reasonable to assume it lay just to the east of the original church. And um, please, on the right-hand image, would you ignore the other parts of a building which you see around the edges there? Those represent the enlarged church. What you see in the middle is the um, mausoleum or baptistry. Uh, it survives almost complete, except for its roof, and it must be dated later than 716 because of a coin of that date associated with it. A stone-lined drain under the floor suggests that it was originally a baptistry. Later, it was used for burials, as Florence of Worcester in the early 12th century, speaking of this church, refers to the mausoleum of Wiglaf, who was the King of Mercia from 827 to 839. In phase three, the church was greatly enlarged. Uh, would you please, in looking, I think I can use the uh, point here, just for the moment, unthink those four column bases in the middle of the crypt there, because they're the next, that's phase four, the inserted column. Um, in phase three, the church was greatly enlarged. This is the building of the standing remains. The lower parts of the walls of the chancel survive, and they're recognisable by their brown material. Again, one can see it very clearly on the exterior here, along with parts of the central square and the east wall of the north porticus, while the east end of the nave can be reconstructed. The chancel turned the mausoleum into a crypt. The enlargement is loosely dated between the middle of the 8th century and the middle of the 9th, that is by Martin, uh, Harold and Goethe. In phase four, all of this is a summary of their views. In phase four, twisted columns and vaults were inserted into the mausoleum or crypt, 
within the 750 to 850 bracket. And those are the columns that I'm referring to. And we can now then go to the next one, which you will be seeing again. Right, within that 750 to 850 range, there is a suggestion that Florence of Worcester's identification of the mausoleum as that of Wigler seems, in Harold Taylor's words, quote, clearly to imply that during his lifetime, Wiglaf made changes in the simple original crypt to make it more ornate for his own burial. He therefore, Harold, therefore dates the insertion between 827 and 839, the years of, um, of um, uh, Wiglaf's reign. And Martin relates the columns, because of their twisted form, to those of St. Peter's in Rome. Fifth phase, the passages giving access to the mausoleum, which you can see on screen there, were extended. This alteration is associated with Whiston, who was killed in 849 and, according to Florence of Worcester, buried in the mausoleum of his grandfather Wiglaf. To quote Martin and Beata's 2001 article, miracles took place at the tomb of Whiston, the church became a place of pilgrimage, and the entrances to the crypt were lengthened to accommodate the flow of pilgrims. Next, phase six, and we go on to the next slide there. This, between 873 and the second decade of the 10th century, Repton was in the hands of the Vikings. They incorporated the church into their defences, as you can see on the right-hand slide, uh, providing it with a terminus antiquem of 873. The seventh phase is that following the end of the Viking occupation in the second decade of the 10th century. And again, I can give you a slide. At this point, the church was repaired evident in the contrast between the brownstone of the pre-Viking period church, which I've already mentioned, and the lighter greenish stone of the 10th century, which rises all the way to the tops of the walls. It has also been suggested by Harold that the new walls were built to a greater height than the earlier ones. Right, the eighth and last phase is Canute's translation of Whiston's body to Evesham around 1020. And here's a summary of those eight uh, phases. Right. Moving to the second section of the paper, concerning the points in the summary which could be debated, I will start with some queries, and I think that's the right way to describe them. Um, I'm not going to argue them, I'm just going to mention them as things which might be the case or might not. For example, whether the mausoleum was ever a baptistry, given, as John Blair has pointed out, the lack of Anglo-Saxon parallels. So we can put a question mark over that, which may or may not be justified. Whether the mausoleum might have become known as Wiglaf's because he built it. Is there a possibility of that, or should one simply put it out of one's mind? Whether the church was not so much an enlargement as a complete rebuilding. Uh, the original means of entry into the baptistry mausoleum it's supposed to be via the, uh, the passages which you see. Are they definitely contemporary with the mausoleum or might they be additions? But these and other subjects are, I think, matters for clarification rather than constituting disagreement. So essentially, I accept everything in the foregoing account except for two things, namely the function of the twisted columns in the crypt and the date of their insertion. So let me just take a glass. First of all then, the function of the columns. And let me start with a slide for that. Back to that slide again. As noted in the summary, Harold suggested that they were inserted, these columns and the vaults they carried, by Wiglaf because the crypt is called his by Florence of Worcester in the 12th century. And Martin and Beata agreed that Wiglaf is a possibility among earlier rulers. Now, it would be very foolish of me to deny the possibility that twisted columns of this kind derived from St. Peter's 
could adorn the burial place of a king. In saying this, that's why I am so cautious, I'm thinking of one of Madeleine Cavanagh's as uh, asides, namely, in Rand's Cathedral in the 13th century, even the king had to dismount when he reached the sanctuary. So I think we've got a, an indication of how elevated the position of medieval kings could be. However, rather than simply looking at the statement and saying whether one thinks it is likely or not, put in terms of a choice between an individual, even a royal one, who was not a saint on the one hand and a saint on the other, a choice, let us say, between Wiglaf and Whiston, the picture is, I think, different because of that connection with St. Peter's. And here they are for the record. Um, the, this is uh, Constantine's church uh, reconstruction of what was there in the fourth century. It was expanded in later centuries. Uh, uh, the twisted columns of St. Peter's are there to mark what one can call the most important site in the Latin church the burial place of St. Peter. On balance, therefore, the connection with St. Peter's, in my view, points less to Wiglaf and more strongly towards Whiston. Richard Jem notes the link with St. Peter's and on that basis associates Repton, the Repton columns with Whiston. He adds that the plan of the four-column crypt arrangement probably derives from Carolingian intermediaries, such as the Church of St. Gall in the A Alps uh, of the 830s and St. George at Reichenau Orbitzell on Lake Constance of between 888 and 913. And I should have plans of those two there. I think the Orbitzell arrangement is particularly um, close to what we have at Repton. At both St. Gall and Reichenau, the context is sacred and liturgical, in the form of either an altar or a shrine to a saint or both. David Rollison in his book of 1989 and Thomas O'Carrigan in his of 2010 associate the columns with Whiston. I submit, therefore, that Whiston's burial place is much more a much more likely candidate for the embellishment represented by the columns than that of Wiglaf or one of his predecessors. Right, now, turning to the more complex matter of the date of the columns. Now here, I'll go back to that one. If one accepts the link with Whiston, then the work must have been undertaken after his death in 849. What then is the terminus antiquem for the work. 873, possibly, or could it be after the Viking period? It is my view that the insertion could have taken place after the Viking occupation. But please note, let me stress, I am not saying that it couldn't have taken place between 849 and 873. I am arguing that the bracket of the dating should be extended. In order to argue this, I shall first discuss the points which have been made against such a date and then I shall present the evidence in favour of it, that is the post-Viking date. Here is the evidence, as I understand it, against a post-Viking date. I have identi identified five points. One, there is the Viking era ditch or ditches attached to the church and those obviously date that church before 873. This is completely unarguable, but it doesn't apply to an insertion made into that building. Two, Martin notes that the Viking occupation brought a, to an end the 9th century Floruit of Repton, as after the Vikings, the abbey was not re-established and Repton never regained its former status. Consequently, work such as the upgrading of the crypt is much more likely to have taken place in the 9th century than in the 10th. Now this is a relevant and telling point, but it does not prevent a post-Viking date. It needs to be considered in conjunction with the evidence for such a date, which I will be presenting in that section. 
The third and fourth points. Well, I have cited Richard Jem in support of the association of the twisted columns with St. Whiston. I must now acknowledge that on the question of the date, he supports Martin's view. And these are the two points which he makes. He hasn't published these. He's kindly communicated these two reasons for coming to this conclusion. And I'm very grateful to him for setting them out for me. He is sorry, as I am, that he can't be here this evening. The first reason is this. After the defeat of the Vikings and the West Saxon takeover of Mercia, sites connected with the pre-Viking Mercian monarchy do not seem to have been favoured. That's no surprise, obviously. And tended to sink into relative obscurity, as, for example, with Brixworth. Now, this makes it unlikely that the church at Repton, so closely associated with Mercian royalty, would have been restored and upgraded at that time. Uh, this is clearly another powerful consideration against a post-Viking date. But again, it does not rule that out. As with the Floroit argument, I shall discuss it in the next section. And here is Richard's other reason for uh, uh, not accepting, no longer accepting, because he, he did once, um, no longer accepting uh, the possibility of a post-Viking date. The capitals of the pilasters and columns in the crypt appear identical to the capital of a column of the arch into the north porticus, now relocated in the porch, um, as suggesting that the pre-873 north porticus and the insertions into the crypt were most likely contemporary. Now, at this point, I must apologise. I have not been able to get, in time for the lecture, a slide of this particular capital in the porch. However, it is not essential because I am perfectly happy to agree with Richard that these two uh, sets, the crypt capitals and the porch capital, are extremely similar. And indeed, the same argument as Richard has put forward with regard to that capital was put forward in the 19th century. It was quoted by the tailors in their gazetteer entry, and this I can illustrate. That's the... Uh, crypt capitals above and the drawing of 1847, the detail of it below at the east end of the north arcade of the nave. This shows the crypt capitals and the detail of the drawing made in 1847. Uh, the similarities between the abaci are striking. There's no doubt about that. Obviously, we must await the imminent publication of the corpus volume on Derbyshire, but my present response is that the simplicity of the forms means that they could be of different dates, even decades apart. This is not a period of um, speedy and uh, extremely varied um, uh, development in capital sculpture. But as I say, we must await the imminent publication of the corpus volume. Let me give you a parallel example to support what I've just said. And that is to compare the capitals of the Clocher Porsche at Saint Benoit sur Loire from the 11th century. There's the Clocher Porsche, and there are two of a whole series of capitals. I don't know, there must be over a dozen. These, these are examples of what is going on in France in the 11th century, where there is an explosion of capital sculpture. You, you think that every single building must have had a suite of capitals. The, um, uh, the varying kinds, the experimentation from capitals which don't have any human figures on them but are different from all sorts of other capitals without figures to capitals which just have figures at the corners and then, of course, as you see in the right-hand example, scenes, historiated capitals. Now, this um, building, the Clocher Porsche, has documentary evidence for two dates, one in the 1020s and one in the 1070s. I think throughout the whole of the 20th century, there has been a running argument as to which of those two dates these capitals belong to. Therefore, it's 50 years apart, in a situation where there is a great deal of variety. If that could happen there, I don't think there is uh, 
any guarantee that something similar, that is a spread over a number of decades, uh, could also not have happened at, um, at Repton. Right, now. So let me now return us to base, to the crypt. And I've come now to the fifth and final argument in favour, or against, sorry, putting it the wrong way around, against a post-Viking date. This is the implications of Canute's translation of Whiston's body to Evesham in the 11th century, which you saw in the summary. Martin describes this as, and I quote, an action scarcely likely or feasible if Repton was then the focus of a flourishing cult, which is clearly undeniable, absolutely. However, its relevance again depends on the assessment of other possible circumstances. So, as with the Floroit argument and the Mercian royalty considerations, it will be examined in the next section, to which I shall now turn to the evidence which supports a date after the occupation. I have two points. The main one here is the growth of the cult of the saint. And here I will readily admit that um, more work remains to be done. I'm relying here on Martin's report of David Rollison's views, and that is that Whiston had achieved the status of a saint before the end of the ninth century, and that by then or later, the church was rededicated to him. This is the point at which we get the, the current dedication. The end of the ninth century places the process of canonization during the Viking occupation. Now, I find this entirely credible that the cult should have grown in these circumstances and declaring Whiston a saint during the dark days of the occupation makes psychological sense. Also, in order to make a saint, you don't have to have a body. Rededicating the church in Whiston's name would, I think, have had to be conducted in the building. I'm sure there are examples of um, such uh, ceremonies being conducted apart from the building, but they must be very few and far between, because I certainly don't know of any. And one imagines the ceremony not having any validity, really, if it had been conducted apart from the building. Right. So the ceremony must then have taken place in the post-Viking period, when the church became available again. It is hard to think of a more appropriate moment at which to celebrate <coughs> Whiston's canonization and having his church dedicated to him than the point at which the Vikings had been driven out and the church returned to what I call its rightful owner. Now, how do these considerations stand in the face of the Floroit, Mercian royalty, and Canute arguments? My response to this is that these clear considerations should be seen in a different light from the proposed celebration of circa 920. They are all to do with broad cultural contexts, while the celebration proposed here is to be explained by the single event of the defeat of the Vikings and the return of the church to um, Christian hands, which can be seen as separate from the wider questions of power and status. The other point returns us to, from the cultural and political world to the material in the form of the walls of the chancel as repaired after the expulsion of the Vikings. As noted in the summary, it is agreed that the upper parts of the chancel walls are repair work, while Harold added the possibility that they were built to a greater height than before. I think there is clear evidence to support Harold's suggestion in the thinness of the original walls. The first thing that needs to be done in assessing this possibility is to establish the thickness of the original pre-873 walls of the chancel, as presented 
in the left image on the screen. Let's see. Now that is the complete picture of what you saw a part of before, if I use this. The, we were looking before at the mausoleum down here, and this is the church that was built over it uh, at, a, at a, a subsequent date. And you can see there, let me see if I can get this on it, that is the top, oh sorry, I shouldn't have done that. I must remember not to click on, oh heavens, what am I doing now? <laughs> How do I go backwards? Yes, wait a minute, there we are. Now, I've got to be very careful with this mouse, obviously. Um, we're talking about the top of the wall there, which gives you the thickness of the wall there. This is Harold Taylor's uh, projection. Right. Um, the walls of the original chancel are no thicker than the top of the mausoleum walls on which they stand. That is, as illustrated in Harold's section, some 50 centimetres between the external face of the wall and the internal face of the crypt. So let me see if I can pick, point these out without clicking on anything. There's the exterior face of the wall, the one which is, we've looked at in the slide, and here is the interior face of the crypt. So that gives you the distance between those two surfaces gives you that which is, as I say, 50 centimetres. Using the dimensions provided in the Taylor's Gazetteer and in the section on the subject in their thematic volume, I find that the four thinnest walls recorded in Anglo-Saxon churches are translated into metric, obviously, 53, 56, 58, and 61 centimetres thick, making the original Repton wall the narrowest recorded. It is not known how tall the original walls at Repton were, nor does the data in the Taylor's volumes supply comparative heights for these thinnest walls, presumably because so few of them have survived to ascertainable full height but it may be useful to compare the old walls with the new ones. Right, the new walls at Repton are 70 centimetres thick, as shown with the extra thickness standing on the extra dos of the vault. Let me find, here we are. Here's the vault, the inserted vault, and that section E is the extended bit in Harold's section. So that takes us up to uh, 70 centimetres. Their height is 8.5 metres from their base on the mausoleum walls. How likely is it that the original walls reached that height, 8.5 metres? Looking for comparators for the new walls from the Taylor's Gazetteer, I have taken all the examples in their 850 to 1000 period for which they provide wall heights. This produces 65 sites, seven of which have walls of about 8.5 metres, and they have an average thickness of 83 centimetres. Therefore, if walls of 70 centimetres or 83 centimetres in thickness are associated with heights of around 8.5 metres, ratios of between 1 to 10 and 1 to 12 then walls 50 centimetres thick, assuming that you can make this sort of transition, should be expected to be between 5 and 6 metres high, or in height. That is differences of, respectively, 40 and 30 percent from the larger figures. The conclusion suggested by these figures is that the walls of the original chancel are very unlikely to have reached a height of 8.5 metres. It therefore follows that when the walls were rebuilt, they were almost certainly substantially increased in height. The blind arcades of the new walls may also be significant, as you can see them in the, or at least the remains of them, in the, in the slide and in uh, Harold's drawing. 
They are unlikely to be a reinstating of similar forms on the first walls because, as the tailors demonstrate, there are numerous examples firmly datable in the 10th and 11th centuries and only one candidate which might, but probably doesn't, belong in the 9th century. Thus, the new walls were not a straightforward repair job, but a new design. In terms of their thickness, their height, and their decoration, suggesting an intention to raise the chancel, and with it the whole church, to a higher status. Add to this the possibility that the inserted columns and vault formed part of the same programme, and we are looking at a major event, which is most likely to be the celebration, after the removal of the Vikings, of the canonising of Whiston, providing him with a shrine and a proper dignified context, and the dedicating of the church to him. To conclude, the paper confirms the history as established by Harold Taylor, Martin Biddle and Birte Kjolby Biddle, except for the function of the inserted columns and the extension of their date bracket to 910 or 920. These disputed points may seem small, but I think the different proposals are important because they relate the columns to Whiston and by extending the possible date bracket beyond 873 and into the early 10th century, they provide a fitting occasion for the celebration of the recovery of the body and church of the saint along with the town. Now, I'm going to indulge myself at this point and give you my favourite example of the relationship between saints and buildings, and that's in the form of the Frankish church of St Gertrude at Nivelle. So I start with the first one, and there. The first slide shows the Merovingian church as it was at the time when Gertrude was abbess, around 650. Side two. When she died in 659, she was buried outside the east end of the church, her grave lying at a different angle from that of the building, something of interest in the study of orientation. Then three. Next, Gertrude was canonized, and in consequence, her grave was incorporated into the church by the building of a chancel-like extension over it. The room followed the orientation of the grave rather than that of the church. The cult of St Gertrude grew, grew to major proportions, leading to the rebuilding of the church in the 9th and 11th centuries, twice, in both cases on a magnificent scale. And here they are on the plan. And these two giant buildings, like the chapel, followed the axis of the grave, as if the saint were responsible for pulling round these two massive structures away from the axis of the original church, graphically demonstrating that saints, while they may not move mountains, can certainly move buildings. Thank you. Yes. 
And I'm interested to note in the paper that you've been receiving some of the most controversial views, one of which has been raised by the question just now about the Eureka uh, um, column, uh, that uh, Eric has not dealt with this evening. So I'm afraid I must say that I think a lot of this is a work of imagination. Um, let's just consider the documentary scene. There is a surprising amount of documentation for Redfern from the last quarter of the 7th century until the Viking episode of 1874. Yes. Uh, a remarkable amount. After that, despite the events that we're invited today to consider, there is actually nothing except the removal of the body of um, Wiston from Redfern uh, to Evesham at some date in the reign of Queen. It seems to me that that is a remarkable absence of evidence. We, we always think, I think, that uh, we know very, very little, but very often we do know indeed very, very little. But if really there was to be such major work of reference, and there is not a single reference to it, and no indication at all uh, that anything of this kind was happening in the middle of the city, I find uh, not impossible, perhaps, but at least uh, highly unlikely. I'd also say that the archaeological scene um, is, is really, really quite clear. Uh, and that is that uh, there's a great deal going on uh, from sometime late in the 7th century, which is uh, well the first piece of documentary evidence, uh, but it's not based on that. As Eric mentioned, we have a coin, a shakla, which means that the construction of the square first phase of the East End can't be earlier than that in the early 8th century. Uh, but that is really about all it is until we get to the Viking burial around the uh, which are both coin dated and radio carbon dated. I should say the Oxford look there has looked at all the radio carbon dates from them, and that uh, a, a joint paper with them uh, and Cat John uh, is, is in preparation at the moment. Uh, and it does appear that the coins which have been fully published, and which do indicate a Viking activity in Redford, precisely in the 8th century, where the Adam suggests that they should be, uh, is completely consistent with the radiocarbon dating of the large amount of Viking activity uh, on the site. But I say again, there's nothing else that happens later. Now, there, it seems to me there are two points I want to make in particular from what Eric has said today. The first is um, about the uh, first stage of the Eastern Army. Now, uh, that building um, is, uh, he said, uh, I believe he referred to what Peter has written, and I've written, that it is a, a baptism. Um, the evidence for that is quite clear, uh, I think, because there is a major stone built channel that leads under the uh, west wall of the first stage of the structure under the east wall of the first day of the rectangular structure going off downhill and can be still seen today in some extent inside the uh, rectangular building until the point at which they're completely interrupted by an enormous boulder which supports the northeast column of the structure. So there was originally a drain from some central feature. Now Eric said there's no other evidence for such uh, that was in Anglo-Saxon England, but of course there is. That's the Church of St. John, um, who was referred to and described by Adma at Canterbury, uh, when that, you know, in the reign of Cuthbert in the 8th century, a church was built close to, but not actually touching, the East End cathedral at uh, Canterbury, and that it was used for baptism, uh, for burial of archbishops, some of their listed those who were buried there, uh, and occasionally for some kind of judicial proceedings. So one would imagine something rather larger than the left as well. But there is this association in the 8th century precisely, well documented, although by the Adma, uh, for this um, association of um, that district and, and the burial. Now, the point I think is very important, um, and of course Eric's detail, uh, which he was talking about, the thickness of the walls, is very important following the lecture, and I look forward to, to reading it and thinking about it very carefully. 
But it is um, my view that the lower part of the upper work of the East Coast, I don't say this, the upper part, we're not so mighty of that, the one with the tall, thin, Tavarsky strips, which will presumably be 10th century or something in that form. But the upper, the lower part of the East Coast, those walls cannot have been built until the vault had been inserted, yes. carried by the pillars. Now, the drawings upon which Berry based some of his evidence are, of course, you have to read them very, very carefully indeed. They're in many cases Harold Taylor's interpretation of how he thinks it might be. But the detail is very complex, and I would need to look at it extremely carefully. But my firm understanding is that the lower part of the east end of the Redfield Church cannot have been built until the vault carried upon those pillars had been Absolutely. Served. So that they are Thank you. therefore <laughs> early. Um, and the question of the date of the pillars, uh, we haven't discussed that, but the question of, that's sort of been raised about certain other uh, pillars, Eric has said frequently then, that the columns at Deventa and Utrecht, and indeed in the chat in the Cryptus and also of Anselm at Canterbury, are parallels to the Repton columns. Um, I'm afraid they're not. Um, this is a question of the understanding of classical art where there are two distinct kinds of spirally advanced columns. One has straight sides with close, um, um, what we say, indentation, spiraling all the way up. And uh, they are very common. They're not common, plain common, but they're very common. You see them all over the Mediterranean. There's another one where the columns are helical, as are the raptor ones. And those are the ones that see features. But the last point I want to make is that nobody, I think, I think, I be very happy for it, but I don't think anybody has discussed the nature of the twists shown on the columns around the tomb of Peter in St. Peter's in Rome. Those columns are two clear kinds, and they are best explained in terms of threads. They are Z fly and S fly. In other words, some go back. And the others go like that. And this is precisely what happens at Repton. Mm -hmm. And if you go and look at Repton and look at it, it's very difficult to work out, but once you're there, you can see it. We have columns which are Z to the left and S to the right on the east side of the floor, and the same on the west side of the floor. You've got to look at the drawing to understand how this works. It is extremely complicated, it's actually very clear. That is exactly, exactly what was the arrangement of the so-called vine columns brought by Constantine from Constantinople, or St. Peter's, uh, in the uh, second quarter of the fourth century. There are very few of these. The straight side columns with the multiple twists are, are really quite common. But helical columns are very rare very rare indeed, until the form was reinvented, partly by Bernini, but also by others, in the 17th century. And in England, you can see most clearly in the south port of the University Church of St. Mary in Oxford. These columns have just one problem going up in the recesses, which is exactly what you get in the rest of the column. And debased as those may be, I think the parallel with St. Peter's is particularly in view of the Z and S five, as I say, it's never, I think, been introduced in the discussion either about the columns in St. Peter's or about the Bookerest, is, I think, quite fundamental. So I see no reason at all uh, to suppose that the uh, crypt at Repton, with its columns and its capsules, were not uh, inserted in the uh, later 7th, perhaps, certainly in the 8th century, and the great series of volumes on sculpture, early medieval sculpture, appearing from many, many Italian authors over recent years, produces many examples of reading capitals like these. And I think the reading capitals of print and the reading capitals of columns, which were originally to either side of the um, approach to the altar upstairs, as it were, I, I think they are strictly contemporary. So in my view, everything fits with 
to a period of documented activity arrested before the Bible events, there is no evidence of any source other than supposition for anything other than the raising of the East End in its final form with the tall, thin pilaster chart, which I completely agree with. Don't let yourself So I, I don't believe that uh, there's any need at all to press the latest stages of Brentford and the idea of a consecration of the system for which we have no evidence whatsoever, if indeed that sort of thing was necessary at this time, rather than by the uh, All this, I think, uh, fits perfectly well with what we know already. But I'm immensely grateful, Jerry. We, we have a very friendly discussion about this. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing this paper, because I think you'll agree these uh, dots, in the French sense, of the word, we have to, we've got to read it very, very carefully to really understand what he said. And I did invite him to put his thoughts on paper, and uh, he's chosen this eminent way of doing it with the lectures of our society, and then I hope the paper in the Antiquities Journal, uh, which I, I absolutely welcome. I look forward very, very much to reading it. And I'd like to thank him very much indeed uh, for putting forward these very interesting reasons. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to um, um, add my congratulations to Eric on a very interesting and thought-provoking paper. And the question I was going to ask, Martin has already answered <laughs> for me, I was going to ask you your views about the, the, the baptistry aspect, because I well remember going to work on one of my visits and seeing the, the, uh, the culvert or drain being excavated that Martin has referred to, and I felt quite convinced that that was uh, a, a channel associated with water in the, the crypt, and presumably not intended because the roof leaked, but for some other more um, <laughs> important liturgical purpose. Okay, thank you very much. Unless there's any other burning comments, I think I'll hand over to you at that point. Right, thank you. Well, let me begin with the baptistry. You will remember I said there are some queries, and I put them into a separate category. I quoted John Blair as saying he couldn't find a significant number of parallels. So I was just raising that as a query, and I said four clarifications. So I am quite happy to acknowledge what has been said by both Martin and Warwick that we can say there was a baptistry there. That's just the sort of clarification that I was looking for. And as I say, I was quoting John Blair, this is not a part of the argument, as it were. So if we can put that to one side, I'm very happy to do so. Um, Richard, I'll come back to your question at the end, because I'm not having heard all the other things that have been said. I've, uh, you know, I may need more uh, information. Anyway, Martin um, has spoken about all the activity, all the documentation that you have in the 7th and 8th centuries. And as I said in the lecture, I fully acknowledge that. The drop, the complete, almost complete lack of documentation in the 10th century. But my argument was that what you have got at uh, Repton is something, I think, is possible at that moment when the Vikings are driven out and the church needs to be rededicated. Now, as I said, I need to go into this in greater detail, but if we can, just for the moment, for the sake of argument, say there is no evidence that the church was rededicated before 873, and indeed you, Martin, yourself, have provided me with some indication that it was after 873, in which case it is after the Viking period. And that is a, a ceremony, it is a celebration. You combine that with the increasing in the height 
of the walls of the chancel. And I wasn't quite sure why you stressed that those walls, the thicker walls, um, sit on top of the extrados of the vault. I did mention it myself, but it seems to me to indicate that these two things could well go together. It, in, uh, in the simplest terms, it means that the uh, vault uh, and the columns were inserted before the wall was thickened. But it's equally possible for one to say, might these two things not have happened at the same time? And everyone agrees that the walls were thickened after the Viking period. Now, one of the points that Martin has made most strongly in his uh, contribution is just how much evidence there is from the 7th and 8th century and how little evidence there is from the 10th. I don't think that that offers you proof of them doing nothing when they are rededicating the church, increasing the height of the walls. I mentioned by 40 or 30 percent. This isn't just a little. This is getting on for in one case, almost doubling the height of the original wall. Guesswork, but it must be something like that. Um, and I don't think that this is no evidence at all, or my imagination. I will repeat what I've said, that the uh, amount of activity that there is in Repton in the 8th century, I fully acknowledge that. What happens in the 10th century is not Repton's golden age. I'm not talking about that at all. I'm simply saying, what did they do in 920 or whenever it was? Did they just say, oh, how nice, and then go off, uh, please dedicate it, rededicate it? Or did they say, this church has a new dedicatory saint? This is a great moment. It's, and re please remember what I've stressed all the way through. All I am asking for is that people think this is a possibility. We can extend this date bracket not that we have to have it before 873. And in fact, I thought of a parallel, and I have to be careful how I put it, because the actors uh, have, have got to be paralleled as well. And this was something in the Norman Conquest. The, and I'm thinking here from the point of view of the West Saxon rulers and how they reacted to places connected with mercy and royalty. Royalty, right. Now, think of the Normans and the way they treated the Anglo-Saxon aristocracy. They treated them like absolute dirt. And yet, they took the Anglo-Saxon saints to their hearts. I'm not saying really. I mean, in terms of public relations. They knew what was wise. As uh, David Rollison has said, not one single Anglo-Saxon resistance movement really successfully ally allied itself with an Anglo-Saxon saint um, uh, to which a church was dedicated. And I think that you could see exactly the same thing happening here. This is about a saint. It's not about mercy and royalty. And it, it gets you on the right side. So let me see if I can identify any... I don't know if I've missed any other point. We've got the baptistry, the walls, um, uh, the, the coins of the 1870s. That's right. These... Um, uh, appeared in tomb 529, I think is the number. I specifically didn't mention that for two reasons. First of all, the, as Martin said, they helped to support the um, 873 as the terminus antiquem. It seems to me that the um, ditches which the Vikings uh, dug in relation to the church do that job without any question. That provides you with a terminus antiquem for the church. Whereas in the case of the grave 529, it might do, but I'm slightly confused. There's just one or two bits which I consider slightly, or how shall I put it, fuzzy or something like that. Let's take the coins, the um, uh, Mercian coins of the 860s and 870s. Now, when we were talking about coins from uh, 716, those coins gave us a terminus postquem. Somehow, when we're talking about grave 529, there are terminus antiquem. It seems to me that there is a good case, at least, no, I won't say there's a good case, there is at least a question over whose sort of tomb this was. I think in one of the articles, maybe the 2001 article again, or uh, another one that I'm thinking of, by Birte, uh, and that is that there is evidence that when that tomb was inserted next to the wall, the church was already damaged. 
Now, if that's the case, we're not talking about something that happened before 873. We're talking about something that happened after 873. So it's a complicated <laughs> issue, and that's the reason why I, I didn't mention it. I don't think it, it increases the certainty of the ditches um, which use the church as, their, uh, um, as part of them. Right. Um, if, if there is nothing in the 10th century, how do you explain the rededication of the church? Was it not rededicated? Because I find that very hard to believe. Now, um, I think, please, could I ask you to repeat your question? If I can come back I to it. I wasn't really asking a question. I was just highlighting uh, people thanking you and highlighting people here of churches opening their churches. Oh, I see. Thank you. Oh, that's excellent. That's why I didn't understand the question. <laughs> right. Well, I don't know if I've dealt with uh, everything that uh, Martin, Martin said, but uh, I've considered what Warwick said, and I agree with him. Uh, the other matters, I think this question is open, and that's my main point. Thank you. course, this is another area. No, I don't think that's possible, if I could pick that up. As Martin said, the, the moment at which Canute says he gets a request from Evesham, he says, oh yes, all right. Now, there can't be a great, um, uh, you know, uh, what shall I put it, uh, cult at Repton in the early 11th century. It seems to me it's just completely out of bounds. So I would say that's my main reason for not considering that. And what you've reminded me of is one of the major points which Martin raised, which I didn't then take up, uh, and that was the other columns uh, in the 11th century in particular. And um, what Martin was doing there was revisiting things that we had discussed before, before we even started this discussion, and things that I have published before. And because of what he said about this sharp division between twisted columns and spiral columns with the thing on the surface, I thought I would simply omit that from the discussion. But since he's raised it, with your permission, President, let me comment. I have been looking for the evidence that in antiquity, or amongst scholars of antiquity, there is a sharp distinction between twisted or torqued columns and columns with a surface spiral decoration. I can't find it. I'm going to go on looking, and Martin can give me a reference on that, I'm sure. But one of the things that persuaded me there is a big question mark over this is looking at Ward Perkins's article on St. Peter's. Now, Ward Perkins is the man who uh, wrote the Pelican on Roman architecture. He is someone that, you know, you really think would be in the swim of things. He refers in his article on the columns at St. Peter's to them as spiral columns. He doesn't draw a distinction between spiral and tall. He just uses the word spiral. And I would say, I don't know whether he's right or wrong in doing that, but I would say that when you go into the 11th century, and I think Martin mentioned Defenter, uh, Defenter, Utrecht, Canterbury, etc., 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 you have spiral columns in crypts marking uh, sacred spaces. And I find it very hard to believe that people in the 11th century would say twisted columns, spiral columns, nothing to do with each other. And the main reason for my saying that is Durham Cathedral. Because one of the things that strikes one about Durham is those spirals on those massive piers. I think that they were meant to make people think of St. Peter's. And there is a reason for thinking this, and that is that the dimensions, the length of the building, is the same as St. Peter's, as with a group of uh, Anglo-Norman uh, buildings. So uh, I don't see this as 
something that one should put to one side. I did put it to one side for the context of the lecture, but I'm perfectly happy to take it up again. And indeed, I wonder if I've got this, if I can just go a bit further. <coughs> yes, there's a, 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 an altar canopy in Ravenna. And as you can see, it has spiral columns marking it. This seems to me to be something of a leitmotif. I know you find spiral columns on uh, reliefs, uh, sculptures, which don't seem to be connected with this. But where you are dealing with something as specific as that, this is exactly the same format, as it were, as Repton. I think that one should at least consider, for uh, at least at the start, all of these examples uh, as being in a category. So I'm glad that uh, I was reminded of that because uh, I had forgotten that Martin had raised it. Right. Oh, there's another one there. I, I think all our discussion, I think we, we will now continue oh, right. outside, the, uh, outside the meeting, if we may, because I think this is the time I'd like to uh, draw the, the curtains. But um, Eric, thank you very much indeed because you opened up for us, you said you wanted to open the issue up for us, you certainly have in a very clear and forensic way, uh, and I've certainly understood something, which uh, you know, is, is clearly very complex, but has implications for the religious, political, architectural history of the 8th and 9th centuries. And, uh, and, and clearly this is something which we all want to continue discussing. You'll be glad to know I'm not even going to attempt any kind of sum up, uh, because uh, clearly this, this is, as you say, an issue that and I think it's what's really pleasing is that these meetings always were intended to encourage us to think about things in a different way and to, to go away and, and uh, think about the things that have been offered. And I think that, as Martin has said, uh, you've, very, uh, you, you've done that wonderfully for us this evening. Um, I hope that you are going to publish something for us so that, as, as Martin has also said, we'll have time to really think about it and, and, uh, and give further thought to, to the deliberations which you've opened up this evening. So thank you very much indeed. And I must say it's been a particular pleasure to welcome back a, 